In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. For our Chaplain's Report today, we are going to be continuing our series in the book of 1 Samuel. Now, for those of you who may have not seen the rest of the series or may not be familiar with this passage of Scripture, the only setup you really need to know is Saul, who is king of Israel at this time, he and his son Jonathan have gone out with the army there at Israel, and they have been fighting the Philistines, and God has already essentially granted them victory. So what is going on now is the Israelites are spoiling the Philistines. They are chasing after them. They are in pursuit. The Philistine army is scattered and running away and scared. Then the only thing really left to do is for the children of Israel to pursue after them and to take anything that they they have. It's, you know, the spoils of war or whatever. And so this is really what has, has taken place right before this scene develops here that we're going to look at in 1 Samuel chapter 14, verses 32 through 35, where it says, The people rushed greedily upon the spoil, and took the sheep and oxen and calves, and slew them on the ground, and the people ate them with the blood. Then they told Saul, saying, Behold, the people are sinning against the Lord by eating with the blood. And he said, You have acted treacherously. Roll a great stone to me today. Saul said, Disperse yourselves among the people and say to them, Each one of you bring me his ox or his sheep, and the slaughter it here and eat. And do not sin against the Lord by eating with the blood. So all the people that night brought each one his ox with him and slaughtered it there. And Saul built an altar to the Lord, and it was the first altar that he built to the Lord. In this little episode, we see greed and haste. We see greed because people are actually going out and spoiling the Philistines, and they're like, oh, look at all this stuff. We can go ahead and grab it up, and let's grab it right now. And the way that you know that greed is taking place, well, partly because it actually uses the word greed, which is always real helpful when you're doing Bible analytics, is when it actually says what was going on, uh, where it just comes out and, and plainly tells you. But even if the word greed weren't there, just by describing their actions, I think that it would be pretty easy to pick up on that. Because why are they acting like this? Why are they going through there like a pack of wild animals and eating the animals and eating it with the blood? And based on the indication, the context of the scripture, it almost actually sounds like they're not even cooking it. That they're literally just, as soon as they can get their hand on some of the Philistines' livestock, they do, and then they slaughter it right there, and then they just start eating. And that's why they're not taking time to have it killed properly according to the Jewish law, and having it clean and cleansed and cooked and, and have the blood drained out of it and all this stuff. Why would they do that? What's their motivation? You see, they're so terrified that some other Israelite might see the spoil and take it for himself that they're just basically trying to get it all there. It would be kind of like if you went to one of these big buffet-style restaurants like your, your Golden Corral or something like that, and they basically came out with all the food and said, all right, you can eat as much as you want, but there's a really big crowd of people, and uh, once it's gone, we're not cooking anything else. Frankly, I'm glad that they don't do that because you would probably see even modern American people turn into ravenous savages. I mean, sometimes you see that anyway when they know that there's more coming out, they're just upset that there's not more there right now. And so human beings really haven't changed much in the, the centuries and, and millennia since this episode takes place with Saul. They're so greedy, they want to take advantage of everything in their sight, and they go out of their way and actually defy the law of Moses, eat the meat uncooked, eat it without the blood, just because they want themselves to have it and nobody else. They're acting like savages. They're going out there and acting exactly the same way as if a wolf had taken down a pack of some kind of animal. 
they're fighting off the other wolves. They're like going and, and grabbing it as quickly as they can and just basically gorging themselves and eating as fast as they can with no concern of, of what's right or what's good or what's decent. They just don't care. They're going through this like animals. They are not behaving like human beings. They are certainly not behaving as image bearers of God. And in their haste, in their greedy rage, trying to keep everybody else from getting their stuff or getting what is due them, they are breaking these laws. Greed and haste are a deadly combination. And whenever we find ourselves in that mode, in that sort of frenzy mode, which uh, hopefully you don't see yourself getting into that all that often, but... uh. You don't think that there's examples of this in, in modern America? I mean, every Black Friday we see internet videos of some crazy woman beating another woman just to save a few bucks on a TV. We, we kind of like to look at these Bible stories and look a little bit down on them and think how much more evolved and sophisticated we are. Guys, we're the same as we always were. The human race hasn't changed. God created us, we're no different really than Adam and Eve in that sense. Human nature remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so, when we look at this, we can see a lot of ourselves in this if we're not careful, if we don't temper ourselves, and if we are not living by the Word of God, living by His codes. Because it's so easy for a person that doesn't have discipline, which, by the way, is the root word of disciple. It's so easy for somebody that doesn't have discipline, that doesn't bind himself to the laws of God and determine ahead of time, before he's put in a situation where greed could take over, how he is going to act and behave and conduct himself. The men in Israel here, they haven't. They haven't done that. What the men of Israel have done here is basically just decided amongst themselves without you know, conferring with anyone, just doing what comes naturally to them, acting on instinct, that they're going to go through this like a pack of wolves, devouring everything that they see. And what Saul does here is, is actually pretty interesting because what they have put on display is a lack of contentment and a lack of faith. They are not content with what they have. They are not content with God giving them the victory. They're not even content with God giving them this massive spoil to where they can go out and basically have their choice of whatever the Philistines had. They're not content with that. They want more. They want as much as they can possibly get. And it also shows a lack of faith, doesn't it? A lack of faith that God's going to take care of them. A lack of faith that... If they're not the first person there or the first person that can slaughter this animal, that, that God's going to be able to provide for them. I mean, in so many ways, it reflects how we are today. When we are so worried and so anxious about, you know, what, what's going to happen with our job or, or what's going to happen with our with current events, the coronavirus or China or Russia or whatever else it is, being overly worried about it, being overly anxious about that, being concerned that we got to go ahead and get ours, or, or what we've seen over the past few weeks where people were attacking one another for rolls of toilet paper or a, a crate of a paper towels. It shows a lack of faith that God is going to take care of us, that we're willing to debase ourselves basically into animals acting on sheer instinct as opposed to reason and logic and thought and a code of conduct that God has set out for us in a manner in which we are to behave. That we jettison all that for this sort of animalistic rage, this animalistic response to having so much put in front of us. And gang, we live in a land where this is basically every day. Yeah, it's been a, a little rough the past couple months, but, I mean, in America, we've got basically everything you could want and ten times more of that, and even the poorest among us are the richest people in the world. Every single day for us is basically this event. 
these people may have legitimately had to worry about where their next meal was coming, and God didn't even deem it acceptable behavior considering all things. Now, did the fast that happened directly before this have anything to do with it? Frankly, I don't know. I don't think it's necessarily right to speculate on that. We already had that lesson. But either way, even if they had, had not been through a fast, that's still no excuse. Even if their stomachs were completely empty, they haven't eaten all day, that still does not excuse this kind of behavior. And because there is that lack of contentment, that lack of faith, Saul actually does something that's uh, pretty smart. What Saul's response is, is that have people bring what they have, their, their, oxen, uh, their oxen or their sheep or whatever they have spoiled from the Philistines, whatever they have gathered together, bring them here, we'll do this the right way. We're going to have it killed the right way, we're going to cook it, we're going to let them partake, and more importantly, I'm going to build this altar to God and we are going to make proper sacrifice to show our gratitude for what we have been given. This is actually... To, to set the stage here a little bit, to give us a nice mental image to help us understand what is going on in this scene, it's kind of like when you've got a big family come together for Thanksgiving and everybody sits down and then just automatically uh, just starts grabbing everything and, and you know, we grab a whole basket of rolls because we're afraid that our brother or our sister or our cousin might get some rolls and so we want, we want all that for us and so we're just we're not even worrying about putting butter on it or anything like that we're just double fisting rolls or double fisting turkey or, or mashed potatoes and gravy everyone's acting like animals we're not even worried about the silverware and finally what happens is dad says hey knock it off let's be grateful for this let's say grace that's a pretty good illustration of what just happened. And even though, like I've said so many times when going through the story of Saul, even though we do see him primarily as an antagonist because of what happens between him and David later in life, Saul shows a great deal of spiritual maturity and wisdom in this. His response to this is, let's give God thanks for what we've been given, as opposed to acting like this belongs to us and, and we deserve it and all of this. Let's go and actually give an offering to God, first of all, to atone for the sin of acting the way that we have acted. And, and second of all, if people have to actually bring their stuff here first, think about what that does. That gives you time to think, to contemplate, to settle down and to start engaging your human reason in response to all of this. With a very simple thing, Saul actually diffuses the situation and seems to set everything more or less right. And I do think that the other lesson in this is that repentance ought not be delayed. When we realize that we have done something wrong, that repentance ought to be swift, immediate if possible. Just like Saul didn't say, all right, well, I'll tell you what, we're, we're going to head uh, go ahead and round up all the livestock that we've gathered, everything, and, and once we get back to Jerusalem, we'll handle that. It's not what Saul does. What Saul does here is he says, uh, we're going to build an altar to God right here, right now, and we're going to go ahead and show him how grateful we are for the victory that he's given us and the spoils that he has allowed us to have. He doesn't say it in, in so many words, but that's essentially what his actions dictate to his army. That that's how we are supposed to behave. And it works. And another reason that I think it's so important that repentance needs to not be delayed, it needs to be basically immediate or very soon after the transgression, if at all possible, is that lessens the risk of relapse. If you commit some kind of sin and you just kind of dawdle around about it and don't pray about it, pray for forgiveness, don't meditate on it, there's a good chance you're going to do that again before you get to all that. And that's why it's so important to make your repentance almost immediate is because it does lessen that chance of you falling back into that same sin again. And I think that Saul realized that here as well, that if we're going to do this and we're going to do it right, it would be better to go ahead and do it right now so people understand A, the severity of it, and B, that they need to be a little bit more contemplative to have a little more faith in God, that kind of thing. 
And so this was a really, really good way to handle this. But ultimately, what I think it goes back to, and I think that this is the lesson that we need to take away from this, God's army is not supposed to be a pack of wild animals. God's kingdom is supposed to look different from the rest of the world. We're not supposed to react to things the way that normal people would react. We do have that kind of faith. We do have that kind of contentment that shows that we don't have to be pillaging through everything that, that comes our way and trying to desperately cling on to everything we can get our greedy little hands on. And that ultimately comes because we know that God's going to take care of us regardless. We, we don't have to be that person. And so, ultimately, adopting that attitude that was in Christ, that, that attitude of contentment, that attitude of knowing that God is going to provide, that anything that we need on our mission we will be equipped to handle, regardless of what it is. And to be content with the things that we already have and, and realize that we don't just need to be hoarding everything or, or grabbing as much as we can, as, as quickly as we can, and keeping other people from getting it first. That's what God's army is supposed to look like. That's what being a member of the body of, of Christ, what being a member of the kingdom of heaven is supposed to look like. That other people should see our reactions to events like this, that other people should look at us and go, hmm, we're acting pretty different. Calm, collected, in control, acting like a civilized human being, not an animal. Because ultimately, if we're going to be the salt and light to the world that we're supposed to be, that's how people are going to have to react to us. And they're not going to do it unless we give them a good reason to. And so ultimately, I think that that is our calling, that we have to act differently than the rest of the world. We have to act as though we are operating by a different set of rules than everybody else is. Because we are. Stay the course, friends. My mother always said if you can't say something nice about somebody, then you're probably talking about a leftist. Nah, I kid. But seriously, it would really help me out if you would like this video and subscribe to my channel. I'm sure my mom would appreciate it.